Good morning. Uh, many of you know that I have quite a commute from Kansas City to Wheaton each week. And recently, during one of those commuter trips, I was on a train and I met a young couple who had, um, they were with their newborn and they were so excited to be coming home to show their family that infant for the first time. And I asked them to tell me a little bit about themselves and they did. They said that they had been teaching and farming overseas among the poor. And I mentioned to them that I had a daughter who was hoping to teach in a distant classroom. And she said to me, I would love to talk to you more about that. So I said, well, you know, I'll be up in the observatory car working for a few hours and come up and join me at any time. So about three hours later, along came husband and wife and baby. And they just sat down across the table from me and snuggled in with that infant to nurse her. And I knew that we were in for a long conversation. I asked them to tell me more about their work and their teaching. And eventually I asked them, well, how long have you been married? About two years. And all the while I was just praying, asking the Holy Spirit to help us make a connection and that he would lead me and we'd get to the heart of the matter. So um, I just happened to say to them, well, tell me, what is it that you love about your marriage? And they did. And then I said, what's your greatest challenge? And they told me. And then being great conversationalists, they just rolled that ball right back to me and said, tell us, what do you love about your marriage? And so I did. I had so much fun telling them what I love about being married to my husband, Mark. And then they asked me, what's your biggest challenge? And so I told them. Um, and then after a little bit, I said, you know what? I would love to hear about your faith. Now, you're Baha'i, right? Tell me what you love about your faith. And so they did. And then I said, all right, what is your greatest challenge with Baha'i? And she said, oh, I know, unity and diversity. How do you do that? I mean, that is our core value, but it's so difficult. And she gave me an example. And what I have loved to have zeroed in there in the conversation, but I felt restrained. And so we kept going. And then she said to me, tell us, you know, like, what are you? And I smiled and said, what am I? She goes, you know, like, we're Baha'i, religiously, what are you? And I smiled and said, oh, I love Jesus. I just radically and passionately love Jesus. And I laughed. And she said, really? Well, tell us, what do you love about Jesus? And I knew that the Holy Spirit had just led us to this point. So I said to her, I would love to do that. I said, tell me, do you like stories? Because I love stories. And they did. And so I asked them if I might tell them one of the stories that I love about Jesus that illustrates why I love him so much. And so we started, and I shared the story of the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. And I talked about how Jesus intentionally went into Samaria that day, to the village of Sychar, to Jacob's well, to this gathering place where people would normally be gathering but at other times of the day that was very likely that he had gotten there at the heat of the day when only a marginalized person might have been there, thinking about their situation where they were working among the poor and the marginalized. And I said, simply by asking her for a drink of water and by having a conversation with her, he elevated her. And I continued in the story. And, um, and then I said, oh, you know, I'm sorry. I may just be boring you of going on too much. And he said, whom I thought had long before checked out, oh, no, please tell us more. We have never heard that story. And I did. What I love about that exchange from just a few months ago is how open this couple, how open they were to a spiritual conversation and how interested they were in the Lord Jesus. Jesus reveals to us the Father's heart God's mission, Missio Dei, in Acts 1.8. He calls his followers, and that call extends to us, to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to take his name and fame to the ends of the earth. And so I would like to focus for just a few moments this morning on that part of God's mission to Samaria, to Samaritans. What does it look like to follow Jesus into Samaria? What are the people like there, contemporary Samaritans? Who are they? Well, we don't have to look far to encounter them. They might be in the apartment across the hall from you, 
or in the house down the street or in the cubicle next door, one of the students in your classroom. With globalization, it has led so many Samaritans to our neighborhoods, to our workplaces, to our hangouts. They might look like us, but culturally, they're slightly different. They see the world through a lens that's very different from ours. They might have a different moral compass than we do, like this party girl, who if those three students had not relentlessly pursued me, my life trajectory would be very different. Or they might be more like these Samaritans, ultra-religious. They only had the Pentateuch in their canon. Do you know people full of law without grace? So how do we share our lives and the gospel in our, with our neighbors and live among them? Cross borders like Jesus did. Jesus invites us to look at this marvelous example in John 4. He gives us an invitation to be witnesses to Samaria. And in doing so, Jesus invites us into a life of being surprised by God. This narrative is chock full of surprises about our great God. God shows up in unexpected places, among unexpected people, with this unexpected offer, and at the end there's this unexpected fulfillment. These surprises all point to a model of how we can help Samaritans find their way back to God. So let's unpack that a little bit. Jesus, the exact representation of God, he mirrors God the Father to us. And where is he? In a very unexpected place. We find Jesus where we would not expect to find a Jewish rabbi in a Samaritan village, where most righteous Jews we know would have avoided. Some scholars say, oh, people went way out of their way if they were Jewish to travel north and south from Jerusalem to Judea. And others say, oh, no. They would have found themselves in Samaria, but they wouldn't have frequented it for very long. But here we have Jesus, not in a hurry. In fact, quite the contrary, instead of avoiding Samaria, he appears to have head directly into an environment that many would have considered risky, if not dangerous. Risky or dangerous to his spiritual life, perhaps he might get tainted. Uh, dangerous to his reputation and perhaps to his political future had he cared much about that. We find Jesus not only in an unexpected place, but he's conversing with someone we would not expect a teacher of God's law, a religion teacher, to be talking to. A Samaritan and a woman, but not just a woman, a woman with a reputation and a past. And I love how John puts this story right here, smack against the story in John 3 of Nicodemus. We see that God hangs out among all kinds of people in this story as Jesus reflects God to us. The righteous, respected Jewish leader and the tarnished, slighted Samaritan woman. We find Jesus living up to his reputation. And what was his reputation? Friend of sinners. And as he mirrors God to us, we see the Father is friend of sinners in this passage. And then Jesus does this very unexpected thing. He gives her an unexpected offer, an invitation to living water, eternal life in the presence of God. Now, being a Samaritan who perhaps only knows the Pentateuch, she might not have fully realized everything that was being offered to her, but I imagine John's readers would have had those Old Testament metaphors and images coming to mind as they read this very powerful passage. This language, language of inner transformation and satisfaction would have called to mind all kinds of salvific prophecies for them. And then we find unexpected fulfillment in the passage. When the disciples return from out there somewhere in Samaria looking for food that was kosher, they are not at all surprised, or perhaps they are very surprised to find her talking to a woman, but perhaps even more so. He says to them, no, thank you, I don't need any food. I have food that you know nothing about. And what is that food here? It is to do the will and the work of the Father. And what is the will and the work of the Father in this narrative? It is to bring transformation to this woman's life and to her community. That is God's will and work for Jesus and for us to do. And can you not live on that for a long time? Does that not nourish our souls when our friends and our family, and even, yes, Samaritans in our life, when they're turning 
and trusting in Jesus and being reconciled to God through him. Jesus reflects to us the Father's heart and his mission. In this passage, he is living out for us, Acts 1.8. He's modeling for us, how do we go to Samaria? This is how. And here we are so surprised by God, this inclusive, expansive, great God who moves into the neighborhood, and not just any neighborhood, but a Samaritan neighborhood. Jesus is not just attractional in his ministry, not just centripetal, where he's gone to the synagogue and he's preaching and he's inviting people to the gospel, but he is also out there moving among neighborhoods, speaking people's language, offering them the truth, a changed life. He moves into their neighborhood and does not expect them to come to his or to his synagogue or to his church or our church building. Will we follow him into those neighborhoods, those third spaces, to those community gathering places like that well? And what are those places in our neighborhoods? What are the community gathering places? I would suggest that they are health clubs and soccer fields. Perhaps God might even call you into the neighborhood pub. I don't know. But we must move out to live among the Samaritans. Jesus, I think, even takes a step further than what we recently have talked a lot about with Celtic way of evangelism, which was what? Creating places of belonging so that people could come in and belong first before they believe. But I would suggest that Jesus goes even further, and he is suggesting to us that we go out, that we go belong to those Frisbee clubs and all those things that you think about that you love to do, that we belong so that people will have an opportunity to believe. So Jesus invites us into a life of being surprised by God and to become like him, to reflect him in our own life by moving in among others. But he also invites us to be surprised in a very fundamental and paradigm-shifting way. He invites us into a life of being surprised by Samaritans. This story to me is extraordinary, and it's no mistake that John has put it, recorded it here in his narrative. In verse 41, John says that many of the Samaritans became believers. And we don't have time to unpack John's use of believer and all the nuances, but we do see an interpretation very near in this text. What did the Samaritans believe? That Jesus was the Savior of the world. Not just the Savior of the Jews, but the Savior of the world. It's just stunning. So how are we surprised by Samaritans? Samaritans are spiritually hungry. People all around us are really interested in spiritual conversations. Look at this woman's question. Some people think, oh, you know, she's just trying to skirt around the issue and kind of get off her sin issues. Others say, oh, no, I think she's just really being, um, kind of showing that she is uh, astute religiously, that she can be in the theological conversation about where is the right place of worship. But I would also suggest that she has had questions, and she has had a burning question for some time, and that she has questions behind her question. Where does God want us to worship him? Where is the right place to worship? And the question behind the question, will God accept our Samaritan worship? Will he accept me? Is our worship acceptable to him? And she surmises that she has found a prophet who can answer her question. Why are we surprised that people are interested in spiritual things? I think sometimes we think, oh, they're caught up with their family and their activities and with work and sports and blah, blah, blah. But they are interested in spiritual things. Why? God is already at work within them. They're created in his image, right? It may be tarnished. Uh, it may be fallen. But they love the things that God loves many times. Look at our emerging generation and their commitment to justice and passion as an example. Samaritans are not only spiritually interested, but they will experience spiritual transformation. Look at this woman, because at some point in the conversation, she awakens. I love it. I imagine that her townspeople had written her off. I imagine the disciples, in fact, had likely written her off. I imagine people in my own life who knew Jesus had written me off when I was that party girl, but not Jesus. And I am also so intrigued by her response. What is her first response as her emergent faith begins to percolate? She is concerned for her community. She witnesses to her community. And what is so striking about that? Most likely, she has been ostracized in that community. 
she has been embarrassed by that community. She certainly is not at the well at the time of day in community when most women would have been there, early in the morning, late at night, swapping stories with them. She appears to be alone in this story. And yet her heart and her concern are for those who have marginalized her. And she is the key to her community's reconciliation with God. And whom else? What is happening in the story, if we read further in the passage, as Jesus is talking about ripe fruit and the harvest, he's looking out on those fields, and the Samaritans all within hearing of this Samaritan woman are coming out to do what? Come see. Come see a man who has told me everything I ever did, which is amazing in itself. A woman who most likely would have been covering up everything that she had done is making it public. Come see. And they're coming. She is key in having her community reconciled to the Jewish community, the very community that had ostracized them. They're going to be reconciled to this Jewish rabbi, to God through Jesus, and to these Jewish disciples. And then the Samaritans ask Jesus to stay with them. They beg him, and he stays two days. Do you not love that image? Jesus lingering among them, God lingering among the Samaritans. He has time to linger, to teach, to equip them as new disciples. And don't you just wish you could have been there? I imagine where there had been harshness between this town and this woman, that there was now a dawning sweetness. I imagine where there had been misunderstanding between those townspeople. Perhaps those disciples had even been looking for food in Sychar. Who knows? But most likely there had been misunderstanding between Jewish disciples and Samaritans. And now there is understanding dawning. Wouldn't you just have loved to have been a part of that? We are surprised by Samaritans who have far more potential than we often give them credit for, for their lives to be radically transformed by the gospel. Interested in surprises? Hang out with Samaritans. That's where God and Jesus are hanging out with those who have a different moral compass. One final story I would like to share with you is from Burning Man. And I'm hesitant because we have Samaritans throughout our life, in our neighborhoods, that we can have these same kind of exchanges with. But as you know, we taught a course, um, Evan 650, a cultural hermeneutic to Burning Man this last Labor Day. Burning Man is a neo-pagan festival where 60,000 young adults emerge on a playa, a desert in the middle of Nevada. It's a, a fascinating community. Yes, there's partying, but there's creativity, and there's artistic expression, and there's amazing things that happen at Burning Man. In the afternoons, our students engage in evangelism, and one of the young women asked if I would go out and perhaps do some evangelism with her model a little bit. So we were out in this large tarp area, and she was doing very fine by herself. In fact, several people were lining up for her to talk to them and pray over. And so I just began to prayer walk and ask the Lord, is there anyone here, Lord Jesus, Spirit of God, is there anyone here that you would like me to connect with? Would you make it very clear? And I saw this woman, and she was scantily clad, and she was gazing at our student, who now had several people deep in a line to be prayed for. And she, looked, she had curiosity over her, longing. And as I began to recognize there was longing there, I just sensed I was supposed to speak with her. And so I walked over, and I asked her, tell me about you. And she did. Uh, tell me what you're uh, looking forward to. Tell me what you're struggling with. And I found out that she had just been abandoned by her husband. And she was starting life over. And she had come to Burning Man like many other people do on a spiritual pilgrimage. And so I meant to mention to you that Burning Man has these amazing 10 core values. One of the values is community. People just love to talk, and they love to get into deep conversations right away. Another value is that everyone is included. And so you walk up to people, and they immediately kiss you on both sides of the cheek, and they just start talking. Another is that it's a gift-giving community, so almost everyone who comes to Burning Man brings gifts. And you'll be standing there talking to someone, and they'll take out their jewelry, they'll take out their watch, and they'll put things on you. They'll give you things. It's just amazing. And so I said to this woman, after I heard her story, may I give you a gift? The gift that I have brought to the community is that I brought a gift of prayer and of blessing, and I would love to pray over you. And she just welcomed me to do so. And as I began to pray for her, this picture came to mind 
of the prodigal father. It was probably a picture that I heard in one of my husband's sermons, but I just vividly had it, so I began to pray over her, this picture. I could see and I prayed about this prodigal father, this Middle Eastern man um, in the desert, and where were we? In the desert, running to embrace his son and to welcome him home, and his robes are flapping and the wind is blowing with us. And he is welcoming that child home, and he is forgiving that child for his wayward life, for his um, self-destructive behavior, for his waste. It doesn't matter. He's welcoming him home. He's forgiving him. And as I prayed over her, I prayed that she might experience God in that same way, as her forgiver, as her father, as the restorer of her life and her brokenness, and that she might know him through the Lord Jesus. And as I prayed, I realized that my hands were starting to get wet, in fact, quite wet. And I looked up startled, and this woman was weeping. She was just weeping tears. And so after our prayer, I was able to sit with her and unpack that story with her. And my reaction to that story and this story from the Gospels is that, Jesus, you are so utterly amazing. Now, that kind of thing doesn't necessarily happen in the confines of our churches, right? But when we go out from church, encouraged, when we go out from campus, we are the scattered church. And we have that opportunity of doing life among Samaritans. And we have the potential of seeing those lives transformed. And then we come back and we worship together. And we swap stories about God's mission and what he's doing and we praise him. There are spiritually hungry people all around us in the least expected places. And may I suggest to you a response to this narrative, that perhaps this week we might spend time in a place that's very unexpected. We might surprise ourselves. And as we're there, that we might hear the story of a Samaritan, that we might bless them in prayer, that we might listen to that story. We might even eat with them that we might serve them, that someday we might have an opportunity to share our story in God's great big story. Ask God how he might want to bless a Samaritan through you, both in word and deed. So, shall we go this week and look for Samaritans? Shall we go to Samaria as Jesus showed us how to do it? And may we share Jesus' and God the Father's reputation and be friend of sinners. Amen.